Good afternoon. Good response, call and response, all right. It is my uh, great pleasure as the interim senior minister here at the congregation to welcome you to this Shelter Rock Forum. My job here is to uh, offer you a very warm welcome for this afternoon and a really uh, meaningful and significant program. This year, our congregation has embraced the theme uh, worth and dignity for all, which picks up on our first Unitarian Universalist principle of affirming the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And the Shelter Rock Forum is committed to bringing to the public some speakers that are engaged in advocacy and action in support of the worth and dignity of, of all, particularly folks who may have been marginalized. So we are uh, ecstatic that you are here as part of this uh, audience, and I'd like to introduce Colin Woodhouse, who is the chair of the Shelter Rock Forum, who will be our official uh, MC for this afternoon's program. Colin. I want to extend a welcome to each and every one of you, and a special welcome to other members, members of other faith communities that are joining us to here today, and certainly members of the Afghan American community who uh, are, surround us with their grace and their talents. So thank you all for coming. Um, the purpose of the Shelter Rock Forum is to provide a platform for well-informed and reasoned discussion on issues of importance to us as individuals, as family members, as participants in communities, as citizens of the United States and human beings who occupy this world, this earth at this time and place. It is our goal to sponsor programs relevant to the human experiment that challenge us to reevaluate established cultural norms and to question the source of opinions that frame our individual worldview. It might help us to remember that we humans were certain the Earth was the center of the solar system. We were absolutely certain the world was flat. We were certain that race was divided into three separate entities. And we believed that we could fight a war to end all wars. All those perceptions were wrong. So I ask you, as you uh, participate in this forum, to keep your mind open, to keep yourself humble, if you will, in terms of the ideas that are expressed. Challenge, certainly, based on your experiences, your opinions, your research, but let's engage in a reasoned, well-informed, and civil discussion. Um, this year, the Shelter Rock Forum is honoring individuals of extraordinary moral courage who dedicate their lives to fairness, justice, and compassion in the belief that every human being has, has inherent worth and dignity. Our speaker today is the Honorable Fauzia Kufi, the first female second deputy speaker of parliament in the history of Afghanistan. Fauzia risks her life every day on behalf of those who have no voice and afforded neither respect nor dignity. Certainly she's not gonna risk her, her life today. She's welcome here in a, in a uh, community of, of compassion, joy, and celebration. Uh, before we formally introduce uh, Fauzia, I'd like to thank members of the Shelter Rock Forum Committee. We, I couldn't do this without their in, insightful guidance. Paul and Tina Coppolo, if you're here, just wave or raise your hand. Um, Jim and Elaine Peters, uh, Jim Ansel, uh, Ellen Council, Vic and Roz White, Bob Nuxell, Latifa Woodhouse, and Vince Chiametti. Hey, there you, we've got two. Um, and we have also been assisted by our staff members, uh, the Reverend Ned White, Claire DeRoche, Social Justice Coordinator, and Ben Borton, our membership chair, a membership coordinator. And certainly in the trenches have been Jen Sapel, our communications coordinator, and above all, Sharon Esposito, who kept us on the straight and narrow and has done all this organization. Uh, what makes today so special? We, uh, the Shelter Rock Forum has had visitors come over the past, unfortunately, 20 to 30 years to talk about Afghanistan. We've had military experts, 
we've had columnists, we've had people, members of institutes come and talk to us about Afghanistan. We have never ever had an Afghan individual who represents the people of, of Afghanistan. And what was so precious about this time is that the Honorable Fazia Kufi represents the, the people of Afghanistan. She, she has heard the voices of Afghans who plea for peace. After 40 years of war, what has that done to this country? 16 years of U.S. engagement on the ground in Afghanistan, what has that done to this country? Um, what are her prognosis for the future? What's her hopes, her dreams, as she relates those that are, tell her in private and in public in Afghanistan? Above all, I hope that you get a sense that we share this experience together, and unfortunately we do. American lives are lost in Afghanistan. Uh, we have commitments over there that we, as citizens of the United States, adhere to and accept. So I would like to um, invite my wife, Latifa Woodhouse, to formally welcome uh, Fazia Kufi. Thank you. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to be here and be part of this wonderful forum on this beautiful day. I appreciate your time, your sincerity, and your interest in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, my birth country, has been forgotten the way I see it in the media and the corners of New York and in the United States. And my hope and my wishes are always to bring it back to the forefront. And I am um, privileged and blessed by being a member of such a wonderful congregation as the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock that believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every human. Therefore, I'm able and a proud member of this organization to bring issues like what is happening today in my birth country, Afghanistan, every day, even yesterday, there were 30 people killed in a mosque. There were 54 people killed, not sure exactly the number, so I can't give you the exact statistics, in Wazir Akbar Khan Mina, which is a wonderful, beautiful neighborhood, but most of the embassies are there. Afghanistan has never, ever seen during the 40 years peace in prosperity the way the Afghanistan that I grew up in. Therefore, we are honored and it is my pleasure to introduce the Vice President of the Parliament of Afghanistan, a woman, a strong woman with her strength and her hard work to stand to the atrocity of the, what's happening in Afghanistan today and to be the spokesperson for children for women, for all human rights. She's not only the Vice President of the Afghan Parliament, she is a very well-written author of a book called My Favorite Daughter, which was on the bestseller of the New York Times from 2012 to 2014. It is an honor to have our wonderful Fauzia Kufi, the one and only amazing woman of Afghanistan who also ran for the presidency of Afghanistan. Please come and... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much all for being here and for, with your presence, for demonstrating your support still to Afghan people and for Afghanistan. When I received uh, an email uh, from Latifa John, thank you, for uh, giving me the chance to speak here today, um, giving the fact that what's going on in my country, a uh, very busy schedule of politicians always, um, I was not sure if I can make it and, uh, you know, I had to make a choice. Um, to come or stay there, um, you know, being involved in so many things, including um, confirming uh, cabinet ministers that will be in our agenda for this week. Um, but then I chose to come, and there was a few reasons for it. Um, the first one was that uh, 
um, I understand this is the longest war that your country has been involved in. Um, I understand you want to see um, a different Afghanistan, like many of us are so desperate to see. Um, but I wanted to give my own uh, analysis of why things went wrong and what went wrong. Um, so I thought that I will, if I can make a small impact on your views about what's going on in Afghanistan, that is much more important than just voting for a minister who will do the regular business, um, as always, sometimes, not very good business. Um, so I decided to come. And, and I'm so happy and thrilled to be here. And I'm very happy and honored to uh, be able to meet all of you, but also um, some Afghans who have been out of Afghanistan for a long time. Here I can see some of the faces and recognize them. Um, in 1996, uh, I was a medical student. When the Taliban first uh, captured Afghanistan, um, education was banned for all women and girls, including myself. And we were never sure that we will have the opportunity to go back to school, let alone standing in front of you today and, and representing my country. So that was like a, a dream that will never come true. We were all, uh, you know, we look at the world with all the beauties uh, from the small windows of our houses and from the small nets of our uh, burqas. Um, so we never thought that we will have that opportunity to go back and explore the world with its beauties. Um, in 2001, and you know that um, from 1996 to 2001, what went wrong in Afghanistan in terms of oppressing women. You heard a lot through media, some of you might have visited Afghanistan, so I don't have to go back to what happened during Taliban. But I will just give you a small example of why I came to politics. Of course, I come from a family who was uh, involved in politics. My father was member of parliament, then he was killed by Mujahideen. Um, my brothers were in politics, but my passion was to become a medical doctor. I never wanted to be uh, in politics. But what brought me to politics was basically what went wrong and what women experienced during Taliban. As a woman, what I have experienced gave me the reason and the determination and the strength to come to politics and to change the life, if I could, for other women and girls in my country. Because it was, women were not regarded, um, all human beings, but women were not regarded during Taliban as human beings. Um, one day, I, they put my husband in jail. Um, so I went to see my husband in jail. And then I forgot to clean up my nail polish as a newly married woman. Um, I went to Taliban jail with uh, holding my burqa and then my hands with nail polish. You could see it. And this Talib guy picked up the stone. And you know, this is a country of rich culture for respect for women's rights. Historically, we have a history of 5,000 years and historically, there was some so, uh, sort of social respect for women. So this Talib picked up the a rock, a stone, a piece of rock, which I have also put um, in my book, and threw it um, to me and said, go because, you, how come you wear this? This is anti-Islamic when you wear the nail polish. So they were putting norms and standards uh, only for women. Even also for men, because even for a man to be eligible to go to the society, to go to education, to go to work, he had to have certain uh, measure of beard. And sometimes they will measure your beard. If, if you are not to that measure, they will just start beating you. Um, and Afghan families, especially men, there is a tradition of protecting your wife and your family. But during Taliban, what happened was even they took that value and culture from us. So I remember when I was going to do shopping and there was a woman with burqa fully covered, but her socks were white and that was the color of Taliban flag. They start beating up the woman because she misrespected Taliban by wearing us uh, white socks and not respecting the Taliban flag. And you know, what was the sad part of it? Because for Taliban, we don't blame that was their mentality. 
The sad part of this was she was with her husband riding a bicycle. And then for the, for the husband to protect himself, he denied that this is his wife. And that was the most heartbreaking moment for me because traditionally we do respect our wives. Traditionally we do protect them. And that, that's why Afghanistan protection family system is so strong that we don't have uh, street children as such per the UN definition, or we don't have women in the streets as per the UN definition with no houses because the family protection system is so strong that there will be somebody from your family to protect you. There will be your husband, your brother, your somebody from your family to protect you. But during Taliban, they took that um, moral value from us, from our people. And those were all the reasons to give me enough reasons to come to politics. So in 2001, when the Americans, along with other international community, came to Afghanistan after the 11th September attack to New York, I know for many of you, you were not happy, but for us, for, for women in Afghanistan, the fact that we could go in the streets of Kabul and breathe without fear of being beaten up by Taliban, or the fear of being put in prison by Taliban for no reason, was a positive change, was a huge change in our life. I understand so, some of you might not be happy with your mission in Afghanistan, with the fact that what the U.S. does in Afghanistan, I heard in the morning. But for, for us, that was a freedom, that we could go without being beaten up, we could establish schools, we could have education, we could have women back to work, and some level of respect and dignity. And so that was the time um, that life came back to Afghanistan. Expectations were raised. And you know, the Americans and a lot, uh, other international community came to Afghanistan not only because they wanted to save Afghanistan, but they wanted to protect themselves because of what happened in 11 September um, uh, 2001. In 9 September 2001, because of your own security, you came to Afghanistan. Because before that, we were shouting, we were screaming that we are a victim of terrorism. And you know, the United States was about to recognize Taliban as a legal government of Afghanistan. If there was no 11 September attack, uh, the Taliban government was about to be recognized as a legal government of Afghanistan. So it was only the 11 September attack that kind of waken up the world, including the United States, that we have to do something to protect our own soil, not only Afghans. So you came to Afghanistan for three main reasons. One was to establish democracy or help people of Afghanistan establish democracy. Dismantle Al-Qaeda and then get rid of Taliban. 16 years, almost 17, where we are now. I think you helped uh, people of Afghanistan to the great extent to establish democracy. And there are many examples of that. For the first time in our history, we have a parliament that has 25% women representation. I think more than the United States. Uh, I think you have to do something to have more women in your leadership, including women president. Uh, we, have, uh, we are the 25th country in the world that has more female politicians. Of course, there is a quota. There is a positive discrimination according to the law for us. But that is still a, uh, a big achievement. We have a constitution uh, that um, is clearly stated in the constitution, respect for all human, regardless of their gender or ethnicity or religion, which is one of the modern constitution in our region, in South Asia. We have very dynamic media. And in fact, I was nominating one of the journalists yesterday, female journalists of Afghanistan yesterday, to one of the programs in Turkey. And this morning I received a call saying that, Ms. Kofi, this journalist is very prominent, but we are not happy with this media because this media is so progressive. Um, so can you introduce somebody else? It's an indication of how our media is dynamic and progressive and gave life to um, to Afghan voices. Um, we had elections uh, since 2003. We had a um, couple of elections, including um, three presidential elections. 
and three parliamentary, two parliamentary elections, one to, be, uh, um, to have it in 2018, next year. Um, the elections were not fine, but we are in the beginning of democracy. Um, we have um, 11 million children in school, out of which 40% for zero are girls. Um, that's a huge ach achievement. I think comparing to wh when I was, you know, uh, promoting girls' education uh, with UNICEF um, in, in 2000, 2001, when, um, you know, we hardly could have some homeschool uh, base for girls, uh, uh, schools that were functioning at home. Now we have almost um, 4 million children, uh, girls' children back to school. And this is from all over Afghanistan. This is from every Afghan woman wants to send their child back to school. Um, I remember when I was a child, my father was the first in our community to establish a school. But he never allowed my sisters to go to school. I was the first child from my family to go to school. And that was because of a lot of tra uh, you know, struggle and support of my mother that I managed to go to school. My sister never managed to go to school. They actually went to school when they were married. And that's why one of my other sisters from another constituents is also a member of parliament. She went to school when she was married. Never th during the time that my father was a member of parliament because he was against girls' education also himself. Now, from, because of the society, the conservative uh, community, the closed society, now from every part of my country, women wants to send their children to school. I receive calls from places like Kandahar, where supposed to be, they are known for being conservative. The woman wants their girls to go to school and they want female teachers, they want school building, etc. So that is a societal change that you don't see it in media. Because in media, what you see is basically the number of people killed, the number of, you know, uh, not only Afghans, but Americans who are killed in Afghanistan. You basically hear the negative news, which is a true. It's a fact about Afghanistan. But you don't also hear the societal changes. You don't hear about the fact that I had to struggle uh, every day to go to school. Because my brothers, if they were not happy, for me to go to school, they would tear my back and they would say, no, you're not allowed to go to school today or at all. Then it was my mother who had to lobby again and lobby again and then convince them. And then the next day they will buy me another bag, school bag, to allow me to go to school. But nowadays, every girl wants to school. And that's why my daughter is studying in Montclair University in the United States. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, I think that's a huge, uh, societal change uh, that demonstrates Afghanistan is in progress, which you don't see those reports in media. But in the meantime, Afghanistan is still suffering from huge challenges. So out of the three missions the U.S. had, democracy for people, we are there. But let's remind ourselves, Afghanistan has been a democratic society. We, are, we have not been a very close society. We are a conservative society, but we have never been a country that hosts terrorism or extremism. We have not been an extreme society. We have been a so conservative society, but we had our own way of life. We had small jergas or shuras that, uh, you know, were functioning in villages. People had their own way of, you know, participating in power. But Afghanistan has traditionally been a country that uh, uh, listens to people before war, before, um, you know, the revolution in Afghanistan happened. But what happened to other two objectives of, uh, of the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan? dismantling Al-Qaeda. Um, Al-Qaeda is not a functioning terroristic networks, network in Afghanistan. And you know that the, the leader was, as, was killed in Pakistan. We all know that, right? We remember that. It, it was killed, he was killed 40 kilometers away from the capital of Pakistan, from Islamabad. And then Taliban are still there. And there is another new phenomenon called ISIS or the Daesh which is another global threat. So what went wrong? Why after 16 years, uh, Afghanistan and the region is still, still suffering from um, deteriorating security situation? There are a few reasons I would like to mention, and I would like you to remember. The first one is the Iraq war. I think it was a big mistake for, for United States to get involved at the same time in two big wars. The Iraq war was a mistake at least for Afghans. Because the whole in, um, intention went to Iraq, and that was the time that it gave 
um, more energy to Taliban, more time to re-emerge um, and revise their strategy. So this was the first mistake. The second one was that the U.S. involvement in the villages of Afghanistan, instead of looking at, you know, uh, the main safe havens of Taliban. Um, I heard the guy who spoke uh, in the morning who served in Kandahar. We had, um, you know, a lot of U.S. but other troops, NATO um, and ISAF, which is now called uh, uh, the Resolute Support. They used to call them um, International Forces for Security, but now they, are, they changed the name after 2014. They call them um, Resolute Support. So there is a lot of forces in different places of Afghanistan. Um, I think they got involved too much in the villages of Afghanistan. It was only in 2006, 2008 actually, that eventually the security responsibility was handed over to our security forces. Before 2008, the whole uh, ISAF or international forces with NATO was responsible for security of our towns, villages, everything, which was again a mistake because going from United States, being in Afghanistan for two years, that's what they do, usually two years, diplomats also, which is uh, another thing. They have to stay longer to know what is going on. Two years is very short. Sometimes the diplomats stay for one year. Um, so they, they got involved in the villages, in, in, in the war that, you know, in the battlefield, basically. This was something that the U.S. could prevent. Uh, because our forces know our country, they know A to Z of our country, they should have been the one who should have received enough support to get involved uh, in the villages, not them. Because we, we have terrible stories. You remember uh, um, a guy who in Kandahar got out of uh, his base, went to kill almost uh, 16 Afghans at midnight. So those all, um, and, and this such evidence gave such incidents, gave ev um, enough evidence to those who oppose U.S. presence in Afghanistan to finger point at us as human rights activists. They will tell us, Ms. Kofi, what happened to your human rights defenders? They get out of their bases. They are here to protect the human rights. They get out of their bases at midnight and kill people. Is this what uh, human rights of the U.S. is about? So uh, I know that the whole mission, the whole ISAF and NATO didn't commit wrong things. But few marginalized examples give a lot of evidence for those who wanted to, uh, the, the U.S. to withdraw out of Afghanistan. Now, um, um, our request from day one to international community was that they should focus on the safe havens of terrorism, where they are coming from. Uh, I mentioned before that only 40 kilometers away from Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, um, Osama bin Laden was killed. So our hopes were that the U.S. will get in more tougher negotiation with Pakistan. Because I know that, that Pakistan received a lot of blank checks from United States and other countries for what they do. They named what they do the war on terror, which in reality is not the case. In reality, they the Pakistanis have been receiving enormous amount of money during the Cold War too. And that was the time when extremism and, um, uh, you know, to somehow uh, terrorism started to grow in the region. Because during the Cold War, a lot of Mujahideen leaders were based in Pakistan and in Iran. And the West was giving blank checks because they wanted to defeat the Russians or the Soviet Union then. So the money was spent partly to support Mujahideen groups, but mainly to strengthen the intelligence of our neighboring country, including ISI, uh, which is an intelligence of Pakistan. So the money was spent to strengthen those extreme groups. And that's why the growth of radicalism started from 1980s, when during the Cold War in the region. And still the US and other Western countries continue to give that blank, blank checks to Pakistan, which is a big mistake, I think. Um, they should have, from day one, stopped the basis of terrorism um, so that they don't, uh, you know, become another. Uh, now, uh, there is a new phenomenon called Daesh, which is once again sponsored. Daesh is a global phenomenon, but they are sponsored by, by the same amount of money 
that our neighboring countries receive from the West. So I think this two big mistakes, along with the fact that there was little knowledge about our history, there was little, little knowledge about uh, what should the U.S. do on the ground, resulted to the failure, I would say, of the U.S. strategy in Afghanistan. Now, I know among you, there are people who are strongly against your presence in Afghanistan. I have written a letter which was published in um, Foreign Policy, and this was called Letter to My American Sisters. Um, and when President Obama was in Afghanistan in 2014, he actually referred to my letter because he read it, and I was happy, because he read my letter. In that letter I put, and I wanted to, I wanted to bring some part of that letter here, I put that my American sisters, I know that you lose blood and treasure in Afghanistan. I know this is the longest war you are involved. I think Afghans deserve peace more than any other nation who have been in a long war of 40 years. We don't only lose human beings every day, but the psychological effect of this war has been enormous in our younger generation. The level of people who commit suicide today in Afghanistan is in race. Afghan people seem to be one of the unhappy nation in the world. That's because of the psychological effect of war. And in that letter, uh, people, people com commit suicide, suicide just because they are not happy for very small reasons. In fact, today, I received a message, one of uh, members of parliament, son, who is in my committee, in human rights committee, committed suicide because he fought with his wife. These are very basic reasons. I, it's the psychological effect of war which none of us actually pay attention. Um, so we are very unhappy nation because of the long war that we are into, 40 years of war. So in that letter I have indicated that I know that you are not happy, but please remember that your son or your brother is in Afghanistan for a good cause. And the cause is that they lose their lives, but they keep a school open. Now you might not like it because you want your troops to come back, you want the war to finish. But we want a responsible end to this war. Because remember, in the 90s, when the in international community stopped their interest in Afghanistan, there was no US mission in Afghanistan. There was no US embassy in Afghanistan. There was nobody from United States or other European countries except France in Afghanistan. What happened? The Taliban came. Afghanistan was basically, you know, uh, our sovereignty was questioned by presence of Osama bin Laden. So the fact that you have your presence in Afghanistan help a good cause. In fact, just I think two months ago, the new U.S. administration had its strategy for Afghanistan. Um, I know you don't like um, some of what I say, but uh, these are the realities that I would like to share with you. You know, one thing is that we should not um, as Americans and Afghans, we should not link um, your international relations with your domestic politics. I understand there is different views in, in the United States, but remember all the U.S. presidents since 2001, they were supporting Afghanistan. The, the U, U.S. strategy gives some clarity on, on your uh, intervention with Pakistan. Um, I know that um, the Pakistanis need to be more genuine and more honest on what they do for Afghanistan, but people of Afghanistan look forward um, when it comes to your strategy to give more um, hard time to our neighbors. Because what, if you are not there, what happens? Yes, there are not people with uh, blue eyes and blonde hair, but there are people with dark hair. There will be Arab. There will be Chechen, there will be people from Pakistan. In the same Wazir Akbar Khan, you have heard Wazir Akbar Khan before. This is one of the decent places in Kabul, very famous um, embassies, diplomatic area, etc. I remember during the Taliban time when Wazir Akbar Khan, there was no Americans, there was no Europeans, but there were people from Arab world, there were people from Chechenia, there were other terroristic groups that were 
living in Afghanistan and using our soil against your security, against, against you, all of you. So if you are not there, what happens? What happens is they, our neighbors will reshape themselves and their policies to influence Afghanistan. And we don't have a good experience of working with our neighbors. We remember during the civil war, we remember during the cold war, we remember during the Taliban, we remember how they were, you know, they were intervening in Afghanistan. We don't have a good experience of working with them. So therefore, for the moral encouragement of our people, the message of being in Afghanistan is important. Not only military-wise, but also um, hu humanitarian-wise. I think the weak point of the U.S. new strategy for Afghanistan is a lack of human civilized involvement, lack of civil, uh, civilian involvement. The U.S. strategy, new strategy doesn't talk anything about women's involvement or women's rights. Women issue has become one of the most uh, revenge issue between international community government of Afghanistan with Taliban. You know, in the areas which is controlled by Taliban, they have a trial without justice for women. They just shoot women uh, when, when it comes to adultery. Very small issues, adultery, but, but minor issues, other issues. They just kill women without killing a man. And I'm like, if she committed adultery, where is the man? Or where is the, the other person? They don't kill or they don't do anything with, with a man. They kill women. They sh shoot our women, uh, female teachers. They throw assets on female girls, students, when they go to school. So women are the first target if international community leaves Afghanistan. In 2014, when there was talks about exit strategy, US exit strategy, some of the colleagues that are sitting in the same parliament with me, challenging me in laws related to women. In fact, one of the laws that I presented was the law on violence against women, um, that we wanted to increase the marriage age uh, we wanted to abandon multi-marriage, or at least put con conditions for multi-marriage. Um, you know, something that uh, gives women some dignity, some level of freedom. I was challenged by these conservatives, and I never managed to pass that law. The law is enforced, but, but based on decree. I had another law for women harassment last year, and they were make, giving me excuse that, Ms. Kofi, you know why there is harassment on the street? Because women don't wear appropriate clothes. You have to reform yourself, wear appropriate cl clothes. And then I showed them photos of women wearing burqa and then being harassed by a man with burqa. I said, it's not about woman appearance, it's about your mentality. You have to keep your eyes. Um, even now, we, are, we have a, a debate about a, a law that protects children. Because my mission is not to be a member of parliament. My mission, our mission, once we get elected to the office, goes beyond being just elected members. We have to do something to prove women's equality, to prove that we are equal uh, citizens and we equal right holders. So when I presented the law on child acts to protect children, again, they were questioning the child age. They were saying 18 years is too big, too old to be a child or to be called a child. So put the child age to minimum and what they mean is like um, they were asking me to put the child age as um, they get mature um, mature physical maturity and you know physical maturity is so different in one family and society and country and what they want to achieve is as marry as younger woman as they can because if you are if you are not regarded a child you can you know you can marry 14 years or nine years old uh, girl the same conservative people who challenged me for those laws were, ge were giving me a uh, kind of warning, telling me that, Ms. Kofi, you know, once your international friends leave Afghanistan, then we know what to do with you. I know they were, they were kidding, they were joking, but that was a serious joke. It was a serious joke. The first, first so society, part of society that will be victim a woman. Because women freedom came along with international community presence in 2001. So we will be the first to be affected by withdrawal or irresponsible end of this uh, you know, war. When, when international community just pulls out without putting a proper end. Now when I say responsible end, I mean bringing those people who have different views, who are fighting with us, so that they put weapons away and talk with us. We're talking now about peace process. You have heard Negoti negotiations and talks 
with Taliban. Um, our government has taken this initiative since 2007. I have been since then a critic of this because I just think that it gives more uh, credit and more identity to those people who fight against us and who kill our people, our innocent people. Um, I think they should come to negotiation because in 21st century we don't, don't just solve our issues with war and by weapon. But I think there should be some level of uh, justice. And I think women should be in the negotiation table. One of the reasons I oppose this is because there has been no woman voices. And when we were lobbying with our government about woman involvement in this process, they will give, give us this reason that, Ms. Kufi, nothing has gone wrong. We are still in the first in the initial stage of this process. So when it comes to woman participation anywhere in the world, our, so, our society think that once the decisions are made, then we will involve women. Even if the decision is about women or for women, we have to make decisions jointly. We have to bring women in the negotiation table. Last week I was in Muscat when there was the quadrilateral talks between Afghanistan, China, uh, Pakistan, and United States. And I said, why don't you bring more women? They said, Ms. Kofi, why do you want women to be involved in everything? Uh, we cannot bring women from South region because there is no enough uh, educated woman. And I said, okay, is that what you tell me? I called the governor from uh, Uruzgan a neighborhood of Kandahar. And I said, can you give me a list of uh, 10 women who are educated? He gave me hardly eight, eight people because we're just talking with the governments, right? So I called civil society. I said, can you give me a list of uh, women who are uh, active in your society so that I include them in the peace process? And they gave me a list of 25 people. It's just that women are hidden. In this, we kept them hidden in the society and we don't bring them to negotiation and then we think that they don't exist. So that's why I think if any process of peace, that should be inclusive, first of all. It should be with justice. Women should be heard because we were the f first victim of war. We don't want to be the first victim of peace. We want to be the shareholder of peace in our society. And that was my message to the government. When you talk to them, they say, you know, there is no enough woman active in our society. But now slowly we have made our way to the peace talks. I hope that peace will really come to Afghanistan because Afghanistan is a country with, uh, some of you who have been uh, in Afghanistan, with enormous opportunity. First of all, it's geographical location. It connects Central and South Asia. So it, it's a, a hub for connectivity. It has three billion dollar, am I right? Or trillion dollar, natural resources underground. Enormous natural resources including the one I just saw. Uh, uh, you see this beautiful lady who has been in Afghanistan. She has this uh, lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli. So we, had, we have a country with wealth. We have to use those and utilize those uh, resources properly. We don't want to just be a country that receives aid, but we want to be a country that you know, works in a partnership with the world. And we have all these uh, opportunities that, that, that work in partnership. At the end, though, um, I think uh, the big mistake of Taliban was not killing our people. Because by killing people, the next generation, genocide, the next generation will come. But the biggest mistake was that they deprived our society from education. Because if you deprive a society from education, that society will not have the opportunity to stand on its own. What I'm doing in Afghanistan right now, along with my other fellow parliamentarians and uh, activists, we're promoting girls' education. A lot of investment went on primary and secondary girls' education, but not in higher education. Uh, and I think what um, my friends from Initiative to Educate Afghan Women does is a great job. But I think we have to also support women who go to university in Afghanistan. So I'm sponsoring women who go to university from villages. Come to Kabul, they go to university. And you will be surprised that when I first came to politics 12 years ago, I had girls who were in school, now they are in university. Some of them have a job because of the fact that they were educated. Any of you, if you would like to support girls' higher education, you're more than welcome to contact me or contact the education, the initiative. I would like to thank you once again for listening to um, the boring story of Afghanistan, but I know you all have some level of affiliation and connection with Afghanistan. Thank you for all the support you have been providing for Afghan people. What struck me is how integral women's rights are to de democratic rights in a country. 
that without the women participating, without their, their positions being honored, a country is far behind in terms of its ability to become a democracy, to become a representative uh, government. Fazia, what are the fastest growing career opportunities for women in Afghanistan? What are they? The fastest growing career opportunities for women in Afghanistan. Uh, well, there has been some traditional uh, field of work which women are traditionally doctors and teachers in Afghanistan, but recently women has been involved in economic sector, um, in, uh, you know, in education, in the local areas. I think uh, women involvement in economy, access to resources is the main source of women empowerment. So uh, women involvement in economy in the villages uh, is a great example of how uh, you know, uh, women of Afghanistan has been trying to, to empower themselves, <laughs> not others. You know that in any election in Afghanistan, in presidential election, 35, in the first presidential election, 30% of women voted for the, uh, for the uh, government, for the president. In the last uh, election in 2014, 40, 39% of women voted. But when it comes to their share in the government, we have to s struggle to make women ministers or women in the leadership and when you talk with some of our leaders they tell me that the problem for women is that they cannot travel to the villages and to the provinces so even if i have a woman i met some of our presidents and i asked them why do you don't bring women to become in the security for instance or in the foreign affairs etc and they tell me the problem is women cannot travel to the provinces so i cannot bring them for family reasons they have children etc they cannot travel which is wrong, and I, my example and my argument has been that if you have all these uncapable men who are ministers, so let's have some, some women also. I mean, if you have all these corrupt men uh, who steal a lot of our money and, uh, uh, to invest in foreign countries, why not uh, women? And I have given, we have examples of hardworking women who are involved in different sectors, but I think women in the uh, economic uh, sector is one of the, the growing... Uh, we have a lot of questions. Okay. All right. <laughs> So, this is serious stuff. What are the strategies for bringing adversarial tribal groups together? Those that have not gotten along for many, many years, how do you bring warring people together? It's a very difficult question, and if we had the right answer, then we had peace today in Afghanistan. Um, but I think, um, at the end of any war, there is a peace. And we talk because we disagree with each other. We talk because we don't like each other. Recently, there has been effort, as you know, to bring one of the famous kind of warlord called Golbuddin Hikmatyar to, to peace process. And uh, that process was faced with a lot of opposition. Uh, I didn't have a public opposition. And my reason was that if there is any effort to bring uh, people to negotiation, to bring peace to the mothers who have been waiting every day to receive the dead of their body. Unfortunately, that's the truth about Afghanistan. When, they're, so, so, when their sons are with the army or police, every day they have to wait for the dead body of their soldiers. And there are a lot of heartbreaking stories. So I think one of the means is if Afghans get rid of all these leaders, first generation leaders, to be honest, some of these leaders are working to divide us. But some of those leaders receive a lot of support from from U.S. government as well. So if there is a U.S. top um, delegation to Afghanistan, they don't first come to meet me. They go first to meet those um, leaders who have been dividing and fighting in Afghanistan. So I think you have to pressure the government to, to promote the new leaders of Afghanistan, new generation of leadership. You know, you, you touched on one uh, similar question that this person had. Uh, how do you uh, encourage powerful warlords who are, uh, tend to be lawless or their laws are unto themselves, what can you do to deplete their power? I mean, most of us know that when Americans move, moved into Afghanistan, they tried to fight the war on the cheap and basically empowered warlords that were exiled from Afghanistan. These men oftentimes are back in power now locally. What's the strategy for the government, for you, to deal with these people who have entrenched power once again? I think we have to work with them. We have to really work with them. Sometimes when I have a, a difficult agenda in the parliament, I work with these men who really oppose me. 
And then I received somehow criticism by some of these women. Ms. Kofi, why do you talk to these people? They even don't deserve you to talk to them. And I'm like, we talk with people that we don't like them. With people that you like them and you have sh so many things in common, you already have so many things in common. You basically talk to the people that you don't like them. But there should be some process of justice uh, because people of Afghanistan deserve justice. You cannot just bring them to power because you want peace. Because at the end, it was a mistake of uh, Lakhtar Brahimi, the first UN uh, ambassador to Afghanistan, who uh, said our focus is peace. Yes, at the end of the day today, we don't have peace and we don't have justice because the wrong people were brought to power. So you have to bring them, talk to them, negotiate with them, but that has to be through a process of justice. Because if justice is not served, then you don't have security at the end of the day and peace. Fazi, I have a number of questions about the role of boys and men in transforming society. In what ways are men being educated to accept women's rights? Are there particular role models, uh, male role models, that exhibit that respect for uh, women's rights and human rights? And um, uh, what's the main reason that men are so resistant to having women be equal partners? Well, I will start with the second question. Uh, the good thing is that, um, that, what, that the man of Afghanistan have started changing perspective. You have these crazy people all over the world, right? So you even have them in the United States where they start to beat their wives. In Afghanistan, it's much more worse because we're a society in transformation. In a society which is in transformation, you have a conflict of modernization with older life. So um, we still have those people who have been uh, raised in, in, in conflict and grown up in conflict and they still have that mentality, but we have some man rule model. Uh, in fact, in any election, I just um, urge our leaders to bring their wives uh, to the public. Uh, in, uh, in 2009, I was supporting Dr. Abdullah, who is the CEO now, and I said, you have to, if you believe in democracy, you have to bring wife, uh, your wife to public because democracy is not for our neighbors, it's for ourselves. And he actually brought his wife during the voting to the public. He had his wife come all the way from India. And then later on, he told me that he was really criticized by some of these religious scholars. Unfortunately, some of these religious uh, extreme scholars, they feel woman oppression as the means of power for themselves. And our government, sometimes they support them because they want to have their vote. So if women vote for a government, 39% of the legacy and legitimacy of a government come from women vote. They don't respect that, but as long as a mullah is not supporting them, they care about it. It's unfortunate. That narrative is changing now. Through media, that narrative is changing through more awareness. And I believe we really have to, in our intervention, to, uh, to change the society, we have to focus on man. Because an educated man can allow his daughter to go to school or his sister to go to school. I think we really have to focus on man to change their perspective. They're not easy, but we have to focus on that. Well, yeah, there's some questions about, I guess in general, the misappropriation of funds. In terms of um, Afghanistan has developed a reputation of uh, majoring in corruption to a large extent by virtue of being swamped with uh, foreign money that's oftentimes, or I won't say oftentimes, has been misdirected. Um, and, and allied to that, how can Afghans work on making, uh, or becoming responsible for their own success in terms of how money gets appropriated and how um, a, a power gets distributed? Uh, this questioner is asking, what are the responsibilities of Afghans to participate in this process from your point of view? I think we all have a responsibility. I think corruption is a major problem. A lot of times when we ask, when we approve budget, and budget is one of our means of power and oversight in the parliament with the government. When we have, um, uh, you know, questioned uh, our ministers about the budget, they gave us the reason that uh, some of the, uh, the there is 60% of uh, they call it outside money or offshore money, which is not in our budget. They just, they're spent with international community uh, conditions. They, they spend it their way. 
and that is, I think, a main source of corruption. I think we have to channel the funds through the government of Afghanistan so that the different institutions of Afghanistan are able to oversight that, uh, that fun, uh, funds uh, and, and money that goes. Because if 60% of the money goes through international community, only 40% through our fund uh, budget, so we are able to only, only monitor 40% of the funds that, uh, that is spent through our uh, budget. The list we are not able to monitor. So I think the whole money, your aid and other international community should be channeled through our national budget. Because it's, uh, we cannot have double standards. We cannot have in a way, in the United States, every dollar is approved by your Congress, right? And your Congress and Senate people are involved in that. But in our country, the parliamentarians are kept blind. And when we ask them why the money is not in our budget, they give us this reason that the international community spent it directly. UACID spent directly without letting us know what's going on. Quick question about the role of China in Afghanistan. China? China. Hmm. China. Well, China is our neighbor. Uh, it's a neighbor to my province, uh, too. Uh, we try to involve them in a positive way, uh, especially their investment. And we want more of their investment because I think without China's constructive role in Afghanistan, security will deteriorate further. Because even when uh, the new administra administration strategy you know, gave a signal to Pakistan to be more uh, you know, s cooperative in war on terror, uh, they, uh, Pakistanis rely on China. When they cut their relationship with the with US, they rely on China. So I think we have to keep China on board. We have some contract with Chinese business people in Afghanistan. They try to invest in Afghanistan. We want their rule to be constructive, really. I have a question. Uh, it's in a language I don't understand. Perhaps you could <laughs> read that. It's a, I don't know who wrote it, but it's an interesting question. The question is about why there has been little efforts or investment to promote girls' education in South, in South part of our country. I gave a few examples during my talk. I clearly said that, um, that uh, Afghanistan is in transformation. Women of Afghanistan, regardless of where they come from, North or South or East or West, they want their girls to be, to be educated. Uh, sometimes they gave me a call from Kandahar or Oruzgan, they tell me, I have had such a difficult life. I'm not respected as a human being. I don't want my daughter to have the same experience as I had. I want my daughter to be educated. Because of insecurity, because of Taliban control, not every place we have schools that are operating. It's a challenge, it's a problem. But when it comes to their perspective change, we bring them to Kabul, we bring our female teachers to Kabul to give them moral, to give them training, to support them. Yes, there are provinces, unfortunately, that still uh, the schools are closed for girls. But I think um, the fact that uh, in any foreign scholarship, you have women and girls from different regions of Afghanistan, from south and east, from north and west, it's an indication of progress. So it's not that in south there has been no work for girls' education. There has been a lot of work. Security is the main challenge. Uh, this is a question from another insider, I think. Uh, recently, Ashraf. Ghani replaced Afghanistan's only female governor with a man. What do you, what's your view on this? How does this support female presence in the region, mm -hmm. or the lack of a female, female presence in the region? That's right. In fact, um, there, has been a, there has been a distance between women, or discrepancy between women living in the cities, living in the rural areas. Women who live in the rural areas, unfortunately, don't get enough attention and support that they should have received. Um, and we are promoting to have women representation in the local government, women in the local um, governor or other position, local department of health, department of education. But you know, there is an visible and an invisible discrimination, uh, gender discrimination in our parts of the world. So when you talk about uh, women um, involvement in directorates, like health, head of health department, is the right position to, to, to be held by a woman. In fact, last year I promoted a girl, a, a woman who had a master program in uh, um, uh, public health management to be the, the head of um, a health department in my province. And her uh, opponent, the person who was running against her, um, was a man, a man with bachelor degree. The man was elected, the woman with 
uh, master degree was not elected. And I challenged the process for six months. I didn't allow the woman, the man to go. And I said, bring me the enough reasons. Give me the paper, the interview papers. Um, bring me all the re reasons. And at the end of the day, we found out that this man was helped with the questions in advance. So they gave him the questions in advance so that he gets enough score. It's a challenge. It's a big challenge. Um, sometimes our leaders also use women for just political purpose, uh, just during the elections. But, you know, change, change of perspective doesn't happen in one night. It needs uh, age of struggle. Uh, you are here not because of what you did, because of what the older generation did for you. And you have to do something to pave the way for newer generation. So it's a continued struggle. Sometimes when, as women politicians, I, it's not easy life, right? So <laughs> it's not easy to... When I'm laughing here, it's not the same as I'm laughing in Afghanistan in front of people because it's not easy life. Every minute is an investment of your life for what you do. Um, sometimes I get like, why should I continue this? Maybe I should go to, I don't know, US or Europe and relax and, and enjoy my life. But the next day when, when I woke up and I receive a call from a woman or a man asking for some level of support, especially a woman, asking for some level of support in judiciary, in education, in her work. That is a reason that gave me the energy back to, go, to, to move on. So we all have to fight for equality. And it doesn't come today. It has to come tomorrow. I never had the chance to go to a school. Every day I was struggling. But my daughter is studying in one of the best countries in the world, I hope, and one of the best universities. Um, so it's a, life, it's a life struggle. You have to struggle. And it's not easy. Our government, uh, for her case, I must say, uh, I think she, you know, I don't, I don't believe that we have weak women. I believe that the women have don't, uh, don't have equal opportunities. She was one of those women that was oppressed by her husband, and her husband was intervening. Again, you see, the reason for failure of a woman is not always a woman. It's a man. It can be a man. Wow, that's going to be tough to follow, you know. But... <laughs> But also, <laughs> but also, if a woman is successful, there is a man. <laughs> and if right. a man is successful, there is a woman. But for right. her, was her husband. The, these are questions about the future, Fauzia. They all kind of link together. What it, what's your vision, let's say, 10, 15 years from now? How can we, as American citizens, help in that vision? Uh, and because we are linked together. And how can that linkage really uh, free us both to be better citizens, and better members of our own country, and hopefully better uh, human beings. Mm. In, um, in, in 15 years from now, I believe in an Afghanistan that is already transformed. I believe in Afghanistan that um, gender, as well as other differences, not, are not the main source of division uh, in Afghanistan. I believe that in 15 years from now, with the, with the help of new generation of Afghanistan, Afghanistan will not suffer from that division and discrimination that it's suffering now. Uh, and I have proofs for that. Uh, sometimes when, um, you, when we, s we hear discriminative statements from media or other people against different ethnic groups, and my daughter, who is a young generation, and today and tomorrow of Afghanistan, she tells me, so what, if, sh if he is from Kandahar or from Bamiyan or from all these provinces which belong to different ethnic groups, so what, as long as he or she is serving this country, that is not an issue. And that is a, an Afghanistan I want to see um, in 15 years, an Afghanistan where humans are respected just for being humans. And when it comes to our relationship with United States, um, um, I think our relationship has a root in a society. It's unlike the US, the um, Soviet Union invasion, where there was a lot of op opposition in our society against them. Now, in our society, uh, when the US uh, Afghan strategic partnership was approved in the parliament, um, a lot of parliamentarians voted yes for that um, because they knew the importance of that strategy. There were others who actually opposed it, but a lot of parliamentarians said yes, and this was approved, uh, our strategic partnership with the United States in 2013, when during President Obama's presidency. And I talked to some of these conservative MPs who opposed me on many things, but they voted for that strategy. They say, you know, we believe that our, our, import, our uh, um, relationship with the United States um, long term in terms of their uh, humanitarian engagement in Afghanistan, their uh, civilian aid in Afghanistan is important because we are in the wrong hands of our neighbors. 
We cannot move Afghanistan from where it is. Now, unfortunately, it's a reality. We have partnership uh, neighborhood with Pakistan, Iran, other countries. Uh, for that, we have to have that strategic partnership with the United States. Uh, for, thank you, Fazia. For purposes of, of discovery, I was a former Peace Corps volunteer in Afghanistan. And that was, to me, the golden age. These people were flourishing. I, had, I taught at the university. 40% of my students were women. And those students, they were educators, they were out, going to go out to their provinces and lift up their country. And war destroyed all that. And um, it's, you know, we have in our audience uh, people who had to flee Afghanistan during the Russian invasion and now are very accomplished American citizens. And we have been enriched by this forced migration. And that's a lesson that I've learned that, uh, again, there but for fortune go you or I. And we're all human beings. We all love our children. We all want a peaceful life. We all want education. We want to succeed as human beings. I just want to, there are one more question. I'm going to give it to Halil as a courtesy. He's, uh, he fits that definition, uh, uh, an Afghan American now. Good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I encourage you and the kind of courage you have come forward to this nation and directly telling the American people, which is your government is the policy taking is not doing the right thing. In my understanding, directly, indirectly, I see a great sign of success of American policy in Afghanistan, which is you are one of the courage women stand here and ask for a freedom or right of all women in Afghanistan. And on the other hand, my question is this as a human rights activist. Did any kind of attempt has been done to teach Afghan people, which every Afghan has the rights to, good, to be a good human being. In other words, find ways for their own way and potential to be the greatest individual in their nation. And their nation is on their hand to do anything by sympathizing or be simp to be, in other words, show sympathy to that nation. The world has a sympathy on them, but nothing has been happened. So we are, as an individual, an American, or as a human being, we have to show which we are responsible for our nation to change it. And we're looking for sources, but our responsibility. On another hand, American policy, I think, doing a great job. So many schools, so many roads, so much freedom, so much health care, and many, many more. We have to, as you said, we will make a proper negotiation to do something for our nation, and this is my adopted nation, to do a better world. And all individual has the rights to be good for the first, and if you be good for yourself, you can be good for your nation. That's right. You know, as a token of our appreciation, we're going to give Fauzia. Let me just say that that plan, um, it's a plant with roots. And Fauzia is not going to take it home, but I'm, we're going to ask her daughter to plant that flower here in America because we share the roots of this opportunity. Thank you very much, Fauzia.